Well, when you look at the rate of development on a global scale, there's one country that seems to be moving faster and more consistently than other countries. I'm talking, of course, about China. The question is, is their unstoppable momentum not only leaving other countries in the dust, but also pushing those other countries down? Many in the U.S. say yes, but others say instead of pointing the finger at China, we should instead be taking notes. Joining me from Singapore to talk more about this is Jim Rogers. He is the author of the book, A Bull in China, Investing Profitably in the World's Greatest Market, and also the co-founder of the Quantum Fund. Hey there, Jim. You have said the 19th century was the century of the UK, the 20th century, the century of the US, and the 21st century will be the century of China. I know you've spent the last several years preparing for this with heavy investment there. Explain to those who are confused about this um, and why this may happen. Well, Christine, for several hundred, 300 years, China was in decline. And then in 1978, Deng Xiaoping said, we got to try something new. He unleashed entrepreneurship and capitalism again. China has a long history of entrepreneurship and capitalism. And you know the rest of the story. They've been an astonishing growth story for the past 30 years, and it's going to continue. They're now the largest creditor nation in the world. They've been doing something right. I know that uh, a lot of people talk about maintaining a global financial equilibrium. I'm wondering if you think if this is even possible, or have we already passed this point of no return? Has all the good money left the U.S. and moved to China? No, no, uh, lots of money has left the U.S. As I said, the United States is the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. Nobody's ever sent so much money out of their country as we have, and for, for good reasons, because other countries are doing better. Uh, imbalances will always occur in the world economy. They always have in any way for thousands of years. Various countries put on controls and regulations which impede the flow of capital and goods, and that causes distortion. We have various distortions right now. Looks like we have a trade war developing, and if we do have a trade war, Christine, that's the end of the world economy. I know there's a lot of finger pointing here in the United States by both economists and now that we're deep into the political season, by political candidates. And they're all blaming China for taking U.S. jobs, for not playing fair when it comes to the value of their currency. Your thoughts about this blame game? Well, I wish that everybody would stop blaming. And, I, Christine, nobody in history has won a trade war. Everybody loses when there's a trade war. So instead of sitting around pointing fingers at each other, everybody should be sitting down and figuring out what to do. I happen to think China should open its currency up and be freely convertible. They cannot be an international economy without a freely convertible currency. On the other hand, the United States is running up the gigantic debts and printing money. Now, everybody's making mistakes here, and I would hope instead of getting into a fist fight, we sit down and figure out a way to solve the problem. Is it likely to happen that way? I wish I were optimistic, but... History doesn't show us that. You know, China's politics and policies are still highly challenged by many here in the U.S. I'm wondering how closely you think their politics are tied to their economics. Well, everybody's politics is tied to their economics, Christy. And I mean, you're sitting there in Washington. You must know that. Uh, you know, you work for a Russian network. You must know that. No, politics, uh, well, economics is the most important. And then from economics, it leads to political action or political views. Uh, they're very, very intertwined. Everybody wants gimme, gimme, gimme. Uh, and they go to Washington or they go to Beijing and say, gimme, gimme, gimme. And then the rest of us suffer. Uh, you know, it is not just a new thing for you, uh, Mr. Rogers. You have for years been uh, pretty pessimistic about the U.S. dollar, and I know that you've been investing pretty heavily in China. Just give us a little, uh, tell us a little bit about exactly how that's worked out for you. Well, I can still pay my bills. I still, I'm still solvent. Uh, so far, so good. I think that you're uh, being a little bit modest there. I know you've done very well. Uh, switching gears here. I spoke to a guest earlier um, who said this economic method we are seeing in China, it's not rocket science, that it is in fact following the old economic model of doing things in America, policies adopted by Hamilton, Lincoln, FDR. Do you agree with this? Well, unfortunately, yes. In many ways, that's exactly what's happened. They're, they're following what we did. And, and by the way, back in 1994, when China had a, a, an economic problem, they tied their currency to the U.S. dollar. That's when they did it. And you know what? Washington, D.C. said, hallelujah, you people are brilliant. 
now, of course, in Washington, they're shrieking and yelling and screaming and saying, why have you tied your currency to the US dollar? You need to let it float freely. Well, I happen to think they should let it float, float freely. But again, they've been doing what the U.S. has said many, many times. You, uh, I'm going to make you, just for a moment here, a professor of this class. Uh, for all our viewers watching, maybe they want to know, um, what's the advice that you can give, or, you know, in terms of what the U.S., what people here can learn from China? Well, first of all, we have to learn to work hard and save and, and invest again. In China, they save and invest over 35% of their income. That's one of the main reasons they're doing so well, Christine. They're saving a lot, investing a lot, and working very hard. We in the, UN, in the U.S. save and invest 2% of our income. Throughout history, countries that have saved and invested for the future are the ones that have been successful. So we need to learn to start saving and investing again. We need to change our tax code dramatically to encourage people to save and invest, and then and pay off our debts, of course, which we've now run up. But if we had huge savings, and people were, had incentives to save and invest for the future, then America could have a, a comeback. Is it going to happen? I doubt it. And just real briefly, I, I'm wondering why you think, uh, you have been saying this for years, people like you have been saying this for years, how has the U.S. let itself get so far? Well, you're in Washington. Unfortunately, countries get the politicians they deserve, and I'm afraid we've, we've elected a bunch of clowns that, uh, that we deserve, and they, every time there's a special interest group, they run up and spend more money, and we get deeper and deeper into debt. And when people say, this is going to end badly, the politicians don't worry because they just worry about the next election or two. And then they're satisfied. All right. Unfortunately, we're going to have to end there. Uh, Jim Rogers, I almost didn't recognize you without the bow tie. Uh, again, uh, Qu Quantum Fund co-founder Jim Rogers.